Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Back in 1992, Hurricane Andrew was responsible for 26 deaths in the United States and indirectly caused 39 more with an estimated $27.3 billion in damages across the Bahamas, Florida, and Louisiana. Lots of the southeastern part of the United States felt the effects of the storm as well. Heavy rains and scattered storms blanketed the southeast from August 16th through August 28th from the hurricane. On August 27th of 1992, Vicki Felton left her 13-year-old daughter home alone for the first time. And when Vicki called to check on her as the residual storm from Hurricane Andrew was concerning her, Lee Ochi didn't answer the phone. Today we are going to cover the case of the girl who vanished without a trace under the cover of Hurricane Andrew, requested by our very own member of the Patreon skeleton crew, Nate. My name is Amber. And I'm Gina. Let's dive into today's weird true crime. Vicki Felton and Donald Ochi were military members stationed in California when they met. Only a year after they met, in 1977, Vicky and Donald got married. They transferred to the military base in Honolulu, Hawaii, and while there, Lee was born on August 21st of 1979. Unfortunately, her parents divorced in 1981, stating irreconcilable differences as the cause. Donald continued his military career and relocated to Germany, while Vicky retired from the armed forces and left with Lee to move to Tupelo, Mississippi, so she could be closer to her parents. Even though they were over 4,000 miles apart, Donald and Lee tried to maintain a close relationship. Lee even went to Germany one year and spent some time with her father there traveling. She seemed like your average 13-year-old girl. She was described as kind, sweet, outgoing, and loved pizza and animals. Same, Lee, same. She had even taken an interest in horseback riding. In school, she was considered a good student, especially in math, but could be sort of fidgety sometimes. Sources say she had a boyfriend, 11-year-old Jordan Morse, who attended a different school and had already started his new classes that year, but they enjoyed their daily phone calls every afternoon. On the evening of August 26, 1992, Lee had been out with some friends, and when she returned home, she discovered her mom wasn't home yet. Some sources say that Lee had told neighbors that she was locked out of the house, but others say that when Lee arrived home, the door was unlocked, which signaled to her that her mother wasn't home yet. Regardless, instead of waiting home alone for Vicky to get there, Lee went over to a neighbor's house and waited. Mitzi Phillips, the neighbor across the street, said that Lee had arrived at her house around 8.45 p.m. and stayed for about 15 minutes. She looked out the window and said, there's my mom, and she left. Mitzi said Lee was really happy and chatty, and she felt like there wasn't anything wrong or out of the ordinary. Certainly nothing to explain the events that would unfold the following day. The morning of Thursday, August 27th, 1992, Lee was enjoying one of her final days of summer break before her first day of eighth grade at Tupelo Middle School the following Monday. Lee and Vicky ate breakfast together, read the newspaper, and talked about their plans for the day. Lee had an open house at her new school to attend later that day that her grandmother was going to pick her up and take her to, since Vicky had to work. Then they were going to eat at Taco Bell that evening for dinner. Between 7.35 and 7.45, Vicky left for work at the nearby manufacturing company, Leggett and Platt, where she arrived around 7.50 a.m. This would be the last time that she would see Lee. Vicky arrived at work. 
She wanted to keep tabs on the weather situation as the effects of Hurricane Andrew were forecasted to get worse over the day. She wanted to call and check in on Lee around 8.30 a.m., and the two had come up with a special ring so Lee would know to pick up the phone. Vicky would let the phone ring twice, then hang up and call back immediately. But Lee never answered. Vicky decided to leave work around 8.45 a.m. to go check on Lee. When she arrived home, she found the garage door open and the light still on, meaning the garage door had been activated only minutes prior to her arrival. What she didn't find, however, was Lee. Vicky called out for her daughter several times with no response. Panic began to set in as she began searching through the house for Lee. When she came to the hallway, she found blood smeared on the walls and even more on the doorframe. She checked the backyard and pool area to see if Lee was back there and then decided to call the Tupelo Police Department to report Lee missing at 9 a.m. When investigators arrived on the scene, they found no signs of forced entry, but there were signs of a struggle. More blood was found in Lee's bathroom, along the walls, and on her bedroom door. A blood trail led from the hallway to the living room, as well as blood and hair on the door frame, suggesting Lee had hit her head during the struggle. They found one of her nightgowns and a bra covered in blood in her hamper. Investigators believed that she had received an injury to the head and laid on the carpet for a short time before she was moved as there was a fist-sized pool of blood on the carpet as well. The police continued searching the house and found some more blood in the master bathroom in the sink and a pink haze covering the countertop, which made it appear as though someone, most likely Lee's attacker, had tried to clean some of the blood up. Tupelo Police Captain Bart Aguirre stated that it was pretty obvious that someone had used a rag or a towel to try to wipe clean the counter, but they weren't ever able to find it anywhere. Vicky said that all she could tell that was missing, other than Lee herself, was Lee's reading glasses, a pair of shoes, some clothing, and an old sleeping bag. When Vicky had left for work, Lee was still wearing her nightgown, but she could guess what Lee was wearing due to what was missing from her closet, as it seemed like it was some clothes she had just received for her birthday a few days prior. If it hadn't been for all the blood throughout the house, it would have been easy to assume that Lee had just run away from home. The police also noted that the front door had been unlocked, so whoever had come into the home, Lee likely knew as she wouldn't unlock and open the door for a stranger. The police assumed that if Lee's attacker had arrived just after Vicky left for work, they would have only had an hour to an hour and a half to commit the crime and get away, so they couldn't have gone very far. The police wasted no time in putting together a search team. A dozen patrolmen with bloodhounds searched a half a mile area around the house, trying to pick up Lee's scent as they couldn't determine if she had been taken away on foot or in a car. Unfortunately, due to Hurricane Andrew, the weather wasn't getting any better and the dogs never picked up her scent. A 10-foot ditch that ran along the property was focused on first and then they switched over to an 89-acre area of bush and trees. The investigators spoke with the locals, walked through vacant lots and overgrown land, and even searched the Knox Landfill in Chickasaw County. Bloodhounds were used again to search the family vehicles. But unfortunately, no clues were discovered, and nothing helpful was found. Over the next couple of days, Aerial searches were performed, and local residents joined in the search for Lee across West Tupelo. They concentrated their efforts on looking in locations where Lee could have been hiding if she had been lost or injured. But soon the realization hit that they were no longer looking for Lee to be alive, but searching for her remains. On September 1, 1992, a task force consisting of four investigators was formed and blood samples taken from the home were sent off for testing. Since the technology was limited in DNA testing back then, only the blood type could be determined. 
One week after her disappearance, a $1,000 reward was offered to hopefully prompt anyone with any information to come forward. Two weeks later, the reward was doubled. The home was sealed off. And Vicky hired a private investigator, frustrated the police were operating as though Lee were dead. Lee's father, Donald, was able to obtain an emergency one-month leave on September 6, 1992, and he temporarily moved to Tupelo to help find his missing daughter. Donald had expressed his frustration with Vicky as he had originally been given the impression by her that Lee had simply run away. He said Vicky just called him on August 28th and said Lee was missing. She called him back a couple of days later and gave him the details of the blood and everything else, though. But from the very beginning, Donald expressed his feelings that Lee was deceased and that someone had possibly entered the home and beaten her to death. On September 4th, 1992, in Boonville, Mississippi, a town located 30 miles north of Tupelo, a Northeast Mississippi Community College student was working his shift at McDonald's. He said that while working his shift, he had seen a girl resembling Lee sitting in a blue truck in the restaurant's drive through The police were later able to determine that the child was not Lee. Five days later, on September 9th of 1992, an envelope addressed to B. Yarbrough was delivered to Lee and Vicky's home. B. Yarbrough was Barney Yarbrough, Lee's stepfather, and Vicky's husband, whom she had recently separated from. Barney had moved out of the house and into an apartment about a month prior to Lee's disappearance. Vicky's address had been misspelled on the envelope. There was no return address, and it had six stamps on it, twice what was actually needed. The only thing inside of the envelope was Lee Oji's glasses. I couldn't even imagine what it would be like to get a note like that. The police sent the package to the FBI to test every single inch of the envelope for fingerprints or any clue. The seal and stamps had been moistened with water, not saliva, and it was postmarked from Boonville. They were unable to determine any helpful information from the package and just figured that it had been sent as a distraction. Weeks and months passed, and all sorts of rumors began spreading and circulating, which we will get into shortly. On November 3rd, 1993, a human skull was discovered by a farmer in Monroe County, Mississippi, in a ditch along his soybean field. It had been 14 months since Lee's disappearance, so the first thought everyone had was that the remains had belonged to her. The skull, which had only four teeth intact, was sent to the state medical examiner's office, and with the help of a contract dentist and dental records, it was concluded the skull did belong to Lee Ochi. However, Lee's dentist contacted the medical examiner to ensure that the most up-to-date records were being used, and they weren't. After some more investigating, the skull was determined to not belong to Lee Ochi, and instead belonged to a 27-year-old woman named Pollyanna Sue Keith, who had gone missing from Shannon, Mississippi, in March 1993. Could you imagine being told that we found your daughter only to have them turn around and say, oh, wait, no, never mind. The overwhelming rush of emotions from having your daughter go missing to be coupled with a roller coaster of ups and downs with the package being delivered mm -hmm. and mistaken remain identity, I, I can't imagine. You wouldn't know which way was up or down. I, I mean, at least they found somebody who had obviously been missing and could put her to rest, but God, this poor family. <sighs> the lack of physical and DNA evidence in Lee's case made it frustratingly difficult to catch any new leads or information. Because of this, rumors were rampant. From the very beginning, several people said that they felt Vicky knew more than she let on about the case. 
She was brought in for three different polygraph tests and questioned, two by the FBI and one by a local polygraph examiner. The results of all three tests indicated that she failed each one. She defended herself continuously against the failed results. Quote, I couldn't tell you why. They measure changes in your body, and when your daughter has gone missing and they strap you up to things, I can't imagine anyone's body not reacting. End quote. And this is why polygraphs don't hold up in court anyway. It's a stressful situation to be put under to begin with being given a polygraph test. And this woman is going through so much. There's no way that that's going to be accurate. (laughs) Like there's, there's, there's no way. It wouldn't matter if somebody asked you your name, your, your child is missing. You are not going to be calm. I get anxiety going to the DMV. Mm -hmm. The Anxiety from just being strapped up to a machine would have been off the charts, even if I wasn't going through my child missing. Exactly. Just saying. Exactly. And despite the rumors and failed polygraphs, Vicky remained completely cooperative with the police and the investigation, saying that she doesn't care what people think about her and that she only wants to find her daughter. Like I said, polygraph tests don't hold up in a court and are usually inadmissible anyway. The police weren't able to connect her with any solid evidence to her daughter's disappearance, so she was never charged. Her ex-husband, Donald, still believes she knows something more regarding their daughter. He explained that Vicky had been a trained interrogator for the U.S. Army, and she knew how to handle being questioned. There had been some slight concern on his part regarding how the police had handled Vicky and the investigation, since he didn't believe they had to deal with someone with Vicky's intelligence and knowledge before. Donald's theory was that Vicky killed her daughter the night before and lied to the police and the FBI about the entire timeline, as he didn't feel there had been enough time for someone to come to the house, kill Lee, hide any weapons, clean up the blood in the bathroom, and flee without a trace in an hour. If Vicky wasn't involved, Donald hopes that Lee didn't suffer and that she passed away the same day she disappeared. This sounds like a man who's upset that he wasn't more present in his daughter's life and is just looking to place blame. And I don't care if she was skilled in investigations when it's your own child, like that, that skill and like experience goes out the fucking window. What does she have to gain from killing her own child? And an hour, hour and a half is plenty of time for someone to come in and attack her, do a shitty job of trying to clean up the mess and then take her and go before Vicky figures out that something's going on. This guy just sounds bitter to me. He wasn't the only one that had suspected Vicky, though. Other people in the neighborhood had their suspicions about her as well. Hmm. I don't know. I think it's unless there's something in here that I just haven't read yet that points to her being involved. I think people are just nosy and like to point fingers at the closest person without any real evidence that that's accurate or true. I think that it's just the pattern of a case where there's very there's little to no information and people start churning whatever ideas in their head that they can to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. Mhm. To me it it makes less sense that a mother would kill her child and then try to cover it up and say she was missing than it does for somebody to have actually maybe have been stalking her. <clears throat> Gannon Stout. Exactly. Well, okay. But <laughs> it's, but Letitia's Letitia's way of covering that up was so fucking like you could see through that. Anyway. Anyway. Meanwhile, Vicky had her own suspect in regard to her missing daughter. Oscar Mike Kearns was the Sunday school teacher at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church that Vicky and her daughter attended. He had also had some horses at the same stable that Lee had frequented for horseback riding 
and he had even asked if she wanted to go riding with him once or twice. As mentioned earlier, the front door had been unlocked, so Vicky felt that whoever came to the door, Lee knew, and she knew Kearns. He became an even more likely suspect when he abducted a 15-year-old girl in Memphis, Tennessee he'd met through church. He picked her up with the promise of giving her a ride to school, took her to a field, and sexually assaulted her before he dropped her off at school. The girl promptly reported what had happened, and he was arrested and pleaded guilty to rape. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison, with 16 suspended, but served less than four, and was released in October 1997. It doesn't end there, though. It wasn't long after his release when he kidnapped a married couple and raped the wife. Because of this, he was sent back to prison and scheduled for release in 2019. He passed away in May 2021 at the age of 63, without ever really talking to the police about what he knew about Lee going missing, and the police never did have any evidence to connect him to Lee's disappearance anyway. Wow, what a piece of shit. Okay. Oh, man. Uh, Why do these people get out of prison? I will never understand that. Just to go and reoffend, And then, oh, get out of prison again. I think you've said in the past that our legal system is broken, so. It's so fucking broken. It just doesn't. Weed for 20 years, but sexual offenders get out in four. Okay, cool. Investigators announced that they had a suspect in her case in August of 1997, but they didn't publicly name who it was. Years later, they performed another search on Lee's former backyard. It was revealed that the public works office had been installing rocks as a form of drainage control at the time of her disappearance, which led to the belief that she could have accidentally been buried by those working on the site. Accidentally? This theory was later disproven when cadaver dogs were brought out and they didn't pick up on her scent. Years later, a woman stated during a podcast interview that she had seen something strange the morning Lee went missing. She states that she had been driving by Honey Locust Drive, Lee Street, and she saw a male and a female walking along the road. She remembered this vividly as there was a torrential downpour because of Hurricane Andrew. As she got near them, the man pulled up his hood, wrapped his arms around the girl's shoulders, and pulled her close to him. The woman thought that the girl looked frightened and even considered offering them a ride, but decided against it, saying that she felt something was off. After she learned of Lee's disappearance, she called the non-emergency police line and was told someone would contact her shortly, but of course, they never did. It wasn't until September of 2016 that police took down her testimony. Who knows if they ever would have if she hadn't been interviewed for the podcast. Fucking A. Side note, accidentally buried? Possibly running along the theory that something else had happened to her and her body had been back there. Mm -hmm. How do you not see a body, though? (laughs) Cover of storm, Hurricane Andrew. Mm. It had granted that it it wasn't, you know, it had been downgraded to a tropical storm by then. But still, those storms with the winds and everything can be can cause visibility. Yeah, so much destruction, and maybe Mm -hmm. her body could have been hidden underneath debris or, sure. or, yeah. or whatever. There's there's just so much to speculate on. It's true, yeah. Among the theories of Vicky or Oscar being responsible for Lee's disappearance, there are others that believe that Barney could have been involved. A friend of the family had claimed that he heard that Barney had whipped and hit Lee. Jordan, Lee's 11-year-old boyfriend, said that Lee once told him that Barney had locked her out of the house as a form of punishment. He said that she told him she was scared of her stepfather and that he would yell at her. Classmates remembered that Lee had previously shown up to school covered in bruises, but she had explained that they were from horseback riding. 
which can definitely happen. Investigators working the case never found any evidence of abuse, and Vicky stated that Lee never expressed any fear of Barney to her. Another rumor was that a local doctor had abducted her and buried her in a barn. This rumor resulted in the authorities issuing a gag order since the rumors were beginning to influence the case too much. Mm -hmm. Those who were found to breach the gag order were threatened with a two-week suspension from the force. Throughout it all, though, Donald made sure that his daughter's case wasn't forgotten about. He printed out countless flyers and distributed them to bus stops, local businesses, and truck drivers. He also made sure that her information was sent to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and even went as far as turning to psychics for help, who claimed that a body of water was somehow related to the case. Lee's case has not been closed, even though there hasn't been any further physical evidence after the glasses were mailed to the family back in September of 1992. The police are working with two national missing persons groups and still run down any tips they receive, even though they are few and far between. Tupelo Police Detective Sergeant Cassidy Jumper said, Occasionally we get calls and follow them up. We get tips, but nothing that would break the case. With the advancement in DNA technology, they have been able to develop a DNA profile for Lee, and we can't forget that in recent years, genetic genealogy has been used to identify and track down suspects in cold cases. Jumper also stated that they submitted some of the original evidence to hopefully find something they may have missed 30 years ago. Even with the advancements in technology, it still takes time. So all they can do is sit wait, and hope. At the time of her disappearance, Lee Ochi was 13 years old, 4 feet 10 inches tall, and weighed 95 pounds. She has blonde hair, hazel eyes, and a strawberry birthmark at the base of her skull. Her case is currently classified as endangered missing, and foul play is strongly suspected. If you have any information that could help uncover what happened to Lee Ochi, you can contact the Tupelo Police Department at 662-841-6491 or the FBI at 202-324-3000. Tips can be submitted anonymously through Crime Stoppers of Northeast Mississippi at 1-800-773-8477. I honestly hadn't heard about this case before. Hurricane Andrew was devastating, and it really did overshadow Lee's case. I can only imagine how frustrating that must have been. After going down the rabbit hole and reading everything that I did on the case, I am still torn about what I think happened. It really was a perfect storm opportunity, and whoever was responsible took advantage of that. I agree. My gut is telling me, and I mean, who am I besides a person who's, you know, talks on a podcast, but armchair detective. Right. But my gut is telling me that someone had been watching her for a while and saw an opportunity and took it. Mm hmm. Um, because this was at the tail end of Hurricane Andrew. It had been downgraded, as I said, to a tropical storm, so it wasn't as severe. Mm -hmm. But it was still pretty bad. And, and they probably knew that that bad weather was going to impact people's ability to figure out what was going on or scent track things or follow any sort of lead. And I, yeah, I think they used it to their advantage and did what they had probably been thinking about doing for a while, unfortunately. No, just, people suck, man. People fucking suck. Also, lock your doors. Don't answer the door. I mean, it sounds like they had they had a plan. She, but yeah. And she was never left home alone. Vicky was that kind of mom that did not feel comfortable. She, you know, uh -huh. Lee had just turned thirteen. They're like, okay, we'll let you, we'll let it happen just this once. It's not going to mm -hmm. be for long. 
look what fucking happens. And as soon as she felt like something wasn't right, she got her ass home. Mm -hmm. And there had been other sources saying that like can kind of kind of conflicting in the information. That's why I just touched on it mm -hmm. about whenever she was at work, you know, she tried to call Lee. So yes, yeah, she did try to call Lee. She tried to use the pattern of the phone call, the ringing and everything. But there's also sources saying that she had tried to get her mom, like try to call her mom to have her mom go over there and check. But ultimately it ended up, she tried to call, Lee didn't answer. She ended up going home and discovered mm -hmm. what she had found. Either way, it's not like she just sat at work and was like, meh. You know. No, she – something – because of the type of mom that she was mm -hmm. and the system they had in place, she knew. Mm -hmm. She knew something was not right. It does make me think that because it sounds like Lee knew the plan and knew what – and she's old enough to understand these are the rules and this is the importance of those rules. It, it feels to me like it was somebody she knew. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is one of the main reasons why there are a lot of people think that think that Vicky did have something to do with it. It sucks. It It's hard to think of a mother hurting your own child like that. But yes, it does happen. And I think that because of how she was raised, how Lee was, there's not many other people on a list of suspects that would be capable of that other mm -mm. than her mom. Mm -mm. Oh, man. Thank you to Nate for suggesting this case. I am going to think about this for a long time now because what the fuck happened to Lee? Be sure to join our Patreon and become a member of the Skeleton Crew and earn special perks like case suggestions. We're always up for hearing what you think. So email us at weirdtruecrime at gmail.com. Or join our Facebook group and let us know what you think there. Until next time, stay safe. And make good choices. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. And action. <laughs> Three, two, one. Let's dive into the... <laughs> I'm okay.